This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Spoiler number one is Dr. Lee Friends. It stinks. What is going on? (laughs) What is going on? Episode 51. Submission. And this is not a joke. This, This is the actual submission. 420. Woohoo! Oh, if you got them, kids. Yeah, buddy. The High Court with Doug Benson. The High Court with Doug Benson aired on Comedy Central from February 28th to March 24th of 2017 for 20 episodes. The cases are real. The judge is really high. This is The High Court with Doug Benson. Gentlemen, the, the courtroom genre has been a popular staple in television since basically the beginning of, of, of TV. You can go back to Divorce Court, which started back in the 50s and uh, obviously is still on nowadays. You know, the last 21 years, it's, it's had uh, Judge Maybelline and, and Judge Lynn Toler. And back in the 80s, it, had, uh, it was a reenactment show with... Jim Peck, and who doesn't love Jim Peck around these parts, and Martha Smith. But also you had other shows like The People's Court, which has been on for pretty much 40 years at this point, or almost 40 years, and Judge Judy, obviously. But for every one of those shows, you get a future installment like Judge Mills Lane, The Judge, Eye for an Eye, Extreme, and McKeem, I know Gre- extreme, McKeem. And I know Greg is waiting for this one. The personal injury court episode involving a sex swing. Oh, yeah, with Big D. And also, in addition, we have this episode, The High Court with Doug Benson. And in case you don't know who Doug Benson is, Doug Benson's a comedian, and he's best known for, let's just say, being high all the time. I believe he has a YouTube show, Getting Doug with High. And he also is a popular podcaster with the long-running Doug Loves Movies. And also, I think he does a number of shows at 420, uh, maybe even on 420, but I know he does shows on 420 because he's such an advocate of using marijuana. So Doug Benson hosted this show. And this is one of many entries that um, will be coming up in the future of Comedy Central shows that failed, specifically Comedy Central shows that followed The Daily Show, which failed. And golly, we have a list. Chocolate News, which we talked about on the Cool Kids episode in regards to David Allen Greer, and we can add other shows. Sports Show with Norm MacDonald. I remember that one. The Jesselnick Offensive. Oh, that was terrible. Oh, yeah. These are not good shows. The oh, Goreburger I- Show. Oh, I know I got the Goreburger Show on the list. Too Late with Adam Carolla. The Opposition with Jordan Klepper. Oh, yeah. So many shows. Problematic with Moshe Kasher. Just plenty of episodes that aired in the 1130 or midnight time slot. It seemed like the only good things they had going for a while were The Daily Show and At Midnight, and maybe to a lesser extent, The Nightly Show with Larry Wilmore. Now, of course, by shows after The Daily Show, we mean shows before and after the Colbert Report at the era. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're definitely not uh, including, well, what the hell else could we include? Uh, oh, I know what we can include. Are you are you talking about basically anything that's not politically incorrect or tough crowd with Colin yeah. Quinn? Or when Any, Ben signs money. Oh yeah, basically. I was gonna put in and this will be timely for Christmas. <laughs> yes! Yes! A nice. Christmas. Yes! Yes, yes, yes. And that's on D V D, so we can easily get that. Yes. With a shocking reveal that Steven is actually Santa Claus. 
Was that the special with Alex Trebek? That was the special with Alex Trebek. Yes, classic, classic, he, classic. He defeats Santa Claus and becomes an immortal. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 that's, no, that, that's a, I think that's something, is, oh. is maybe that was the final episode? Yeah, I think that was the final episode. Yeah, that was the final episode, oh, so yeah, this that, is something different. Yeah, oh. this is some, this was like a Christmas, this is like a Bing Crosby parody. Ah, I, well, I know what you're talking makes... about now. Okay, I get it I, now. I remember that, and that's good, yes. <laughs> And this whole discussion about a cold bear Christmas is staying in, by the way. I Just a little that. something to look forward to. We, we totally forgot another entry in the courtroom show. We talked about it. Judge Wapner's Animal Court. Oh, yeah, we did. Ah. And, and we also should add, since we're talking about courtroom shows, this is sort of adjacent to courtroom shows, but this will definitely be a future entry when Conan O'Brien spent a day with uh, with Doug Llewellyn. Yes. <laughs> Which you can now find on YouTube, by the way, on Conan's YouTube channel. And, and, and it's worth every second. Oh, my gosh. What did you think of the judge's decision? Hey, hey Greg, you want to meet Rusty? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, gosh, I'm dead. Oh, if only the episode where Doug Llewellyn was bit by a dog on the People's Court was somewhere online. Oh, and that's a future installment if we can find it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, and got bit oh, by a dog. On... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why he didn't want to go on Judge Watner's Animal Court. He just was like, no, no, I'm not going to get bitten by a dog again. And, and that's also in the clip on the Conan uh, installment with Doug Llewellyn. <laughs> So Comedy Central decided to go into the courtroom show genre with Doug Benson as judge and a guest bailiff every night. Yep. And and you actually had some good names. We'll get to that in a little bit when we run down the episodes. The uh, big thing here is, as you can guess, since we talked about Doug Benson being pro-marijuana and and this being episode 420 being released on 420 – Guess what? He was high throughout the entire festivities. No! I'm shocked. This is my shocked face. I I know. I know you're very shocked. So you had a high judge. A high judge in the high court. Ha 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 ha. I see what you did there. I could sum up this series in six words. Real cases. Real people. Real weed. Oh, yes. None of this clove shit. And yeah, while Doug was under the influence of marijuana throughout the festivities, the bailiff was not, or at least was not, until the deliberation of the verdict. Because the deliberation of the verdict was essentially Doug and the bailiff going behind the scenes and taking huffs from a big bong. Yep. And there's actually a, a clip online of, I forget which uh, guest bailiff it was, trying to smoke. For, oh, it was, it was Jesse Mae Peluso. That's who it was. Uh, trying to uh, inhale from a bong. And I think she inhaled like some of the water from the bong. <laughs> Didn't quite understand oh, how to use a bong. That, that, was, that was heartbreaking to watch. She had to stand up in order to partake. And it's almost like she drowned. It, it was... I don't know if it was hard to watch or entertaining to watch, because if you know, because, you know, Jesse Mae Peluso is not a tall person. And just like every other courtroom show, the uh, final verdicts are real and legally binding. Just sort of like how Judge Judy, yeah, you know, she's like an arbitrator, uh, but the thing is the uh, the plaintiff and the defendant sign paperwork saying what she says is final. There are no appeals, or you can't go back to court and resue. Well, that's double jeopardy, the other type of double jeopardy. So everything was 100% real, especially yep. the weed. <laughs> so again, none of this fake clove shit. This was real Illmatic. 
Real Lottie Dottie. And I find it very interesting, and this is from our favorite Truth by Consensus Wikipedia. Uh, now, the show was filmed in Los Angeles, and in California, in case you don't know, weed is legal. A special ventilation system was added to the deliberation room studio to filter smoke out of the room so production crew and producers would not be impaired during filming. <laughs> Is that is that like the kind of filtration system that you know r- sort of limits the uh, smoke, the ambient smoke, to like one room and that's it, or, or straight out a chimney or something? I'm guessing, sort of like a safety hood without the hood, more or less. And let me tell you, just from experience, back in 2015, I went to go see an episode of At Midnight. And one of the guests that night was Doug Benson. And I think I got a contact high just by being in the same room as him. Ah, wow. Oh, he made a lot of marijuana jokes. And (laughs) and, And the good stuff was left on the cutting room floor. Oh, that might be a story for another episode. Just an at midnight taping, the experience. That was one of the best shows I've ever seen. I laughed my butt off. And funny, this actually aired at midnight, because if you remember, right near the end of At Midnight's run, they moved it back to 1130. Yeah, because after Colbert, uh, no, after uh, the Nightly Show ended. Yeah, after Larry Wilmore, right. So after Larry Wilmore got canceled, they moved At Midnight to 1130, and then started airing a variety of shows in that midnight time slot, this being one of them. And, oh, I don't think we mentioned this. This show is only 15 minutes long, actually 11 minutes after commercials. Mm-hmm. What? The, I, I don't even think there were commercials because 11 minutes, you would have uh, commercials at the tail end. Oh, no. I, next... oh, 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 I remember commercials. I remember oh, that so there... there were commercials. Okay. Yes, uh, it was sort of like. Um, like Judge Judy, or if you watch Hot Bench or any of those other shows, uh, I believe that the commercial break was between the deliberation and the delivering of the final verdict. I think, yeah, the show did the the case first. They they had the plaintiff and defendants pr- uh, give their cases. Then they went to deliberation, and then after they deliberated slash got high, put the break in. Then after the break, come back for the final verdict, and then the post-interview, which you see on, like, every courtroom show just about. Except personal injury court, because damn it, Big D's not going to talk. <laughs> Big D's no snitch. Got it. Well, look at these episodes really fast, and they have just brief summaries. And I remember a couple of these shows. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in where uh, we're needed. Uh, episode one, someone is paying for this tow job. A woman sues for $600 after she lent the defendant her car and never returned it. The defendant countersues for $2,100 because the car had expired tags and was impounded. And the verdict was uh, the plaintiff had to pay the defendant $1,100. And the guest bailiff that night, and she wasn't that big at this time, but she's really gotten big over the last, like, three years. Tiffany Haddish. Nice. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah qual- quality name to begin with. This was Tiffany Haddish before she had her big breaks, before she got on The Last OG, and before she was in the movie Girls Trip. All right. So this, this, so this is sort of like kind of sort of before they were stars-ish. Oh, yeah. Episode two, Driving Miss Johnson. Hold I'm up, not- hold, hold up. Uh-oh. I'm going through Tiffany Haddish's Wikipedia page, it's, oh and no. it says that in 2006, she was in an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia as stripper number three. It and always episode. comes back to It's Always Sunny. <laughs> oh, and she was in Future Entry, the Carmichael show. Episode two, Driving Miss Johnson, the guest bailiff was Jeff Tate. Don't worry, I don't know who he is either, and he doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. No, but he doesn't have any sleeves either. A mother claims her daughter borrowed $3,858 for a new car and never repaid her. The defendant claims she doesn't owe anything because she drives her mother everywhere. 
The verdict. Doug decided to have the court pay off the initial loan and give the defendant a lesser loan to pay. Sounds like he was high there. Why? Uh, okay. Yep. Episode three, Snakes in the Drain with Michael Ian Black. <laughs> A man sues his uncle for $500 for letting his his pet snake escape while pet-sitting. The defendant claims the snake got away on its own. The defendant has to pay the full $500. Oh, and that episode was called Snakes in the Drain. I've had it with these mother-effing snakes in this mother-effing drain. (laughs) I'm glad you did it, not me. Oh, here's the, oh, this is the episode, the Jesse May Peluso episode that I got stuff to say. Okay. Last, last comic stealing, episode four, with Jesse May Peluso. A comedian sues another comedian for $1,000 for using one of his jokes. The defendant claims he changed the joke enough to make it different. And yeah, there's a big rule in comedy you don't steal other people's jokes. And so he Nobody was told Carlos Mencia that, but whatever. Wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Don't you mean Ned Holmes, guys? <laughs> <laughs> wait, should we put Mind of Mencia on the list? Hell no. Yeah, no, no, I don't want to talk about Mind of Mencia at all. Okay. No. Uh, verdict, and I, there was some goofiness in this. I remember this episode. Doug said that the defendant had to pay the plaintiff $35. Sued for 1000 got 35 Which is not uncommon in the practice of uh, court shows in that people will get less than the amount due to at the judge's discretion. Thank you, Breen. I would have rather gotten zero than 35 I'm sorry. That's a slap in the face. Yeah. Sensory, what are you going to do with that $35? I mean, what type of damages would constitute $35? I don't know. He bruised my ego. That was crazy. And then episode five, channeling her anger. And again, we have a bailiff who doesn't have a Wikipedia page, Slink Johnson. Okay, I know who this guy is. He plays Black Jesus. I swear I swear to God, he plays Black Jesus. Okay. He's Gerald Slink Johnson, played Black Jesus for three seasons on Adult Swim on the show of the same name. Wow. I'll take your word for it. Trust me on this. Well, we trust you. We trust you. A man sues his ex-friend for $1,000 for breaking his television. The defendant claims the plaintiff angered her intentionally. The verdict, Doug orders the defendant to pay the plaintiff $400, which sort of makes some sense. I mean, I don't know how old the TV was. You have to factor in depreciation, and, I mean, if this TV was five years old, yeah, you may have paid $1,000 for it at that time, but it may only be worth $400 or $300 because technology gets better. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think technology doesn't get better? Technology gets better, and the people using technology anyway! When they know how to use it. You're absolutely right about that. Episode 6. I ain't saying she's a gold digger. And the bailiff, oh, this is a good one. Reggie Watts. You know Reggie Watts, yes. Oh, maybe we should put this on the list. Taskmaster USA. The heck is Taskmaster USA? Go, you, you, on the list. You, yeah, you don't remember when uh, Taskmaster was done by Comedy Central like two years ago? The only Taskmaster I know, guys, is Kevin Sullivan. Let's get that straight. Okay, Taskmaster was a UK, or still is a UK, quasi-game show where you're given a task and you have to do it within like certain parameters, and they're, they're sort of weird tasks. And... um very popular overseas. Comedy Central brought it over here. Uh, like I said, I think it was like 17 or 18. It aired in 18. 
and Reggie Watts was the host, and five comedians, uh, they're on for the entire run of the show, which was eight episodes, and every week they got one task. And hold, hold, hold up a second. Freddie Highmore was on the Taskmaster USA. The good doctor himself was on Taskmaster USA. Yes, he was. Yep. Wow. If you've ever seen the British version, the British version is really good. But the American version, it's good. But the problem is it's not meant to be a half-hour show. And it was a half-hour show. If it was like an hour show or a 45-minute show, it would have worked out a lot better. Totally. And and also, it was in a burn-off. Comedy Central burned it off on Friday nights for four weeks, two episodes a week. So it sounds like they had buyer's remorse as soon as they uh, saw the final product. Wouldn't be the first time. Well, it wouldn't be the first and it wouldn't be the last, but... Yeah, uh, the UK version is absolutely hilarious and brilliant. Here, it was a little brilliant, but just the parameters of making it a half-hour show, and it lost some of the charm when they didn't bring over the host from the UK version. Not that the host of the UK version would be known around here, but it, it just wasn't right. And that's another show that aired. Well, no, that actually aired. It did air in, at midnight, but it aired on Fridays. It didn't air after the Daily Show. So, yeah, getting back to this episode. A man sues his ex-girlfriend for $2,400, claiming he lent her money to record an album and was never repaid. The defendant claims the money was an investment in her career and not a loan. Boy, this sounds like about half of Judge Judy's cases. It wasn't a loan. It was an investment. And guess what? The plaintiff was awarded half his money, $1,200. Nice. Mm. $1,200, huh? Not a good investment. He only got half his money back. Episode 7, He Took My Money Fast and Now I'm Furious, with guest bailiff Rory Scovel. Yes, that Rory Scovel. That Rory Scovel? Yes, that Rory Scovel. Wow. I don't even know who the hell he is. I I, I gotta see who it is. That, that's why. <laughs> yeah, that. that's what I was gonna say. Like, like Rory, Rory Scovel. He was on. Um, he was a writer for the Eric Andre Show. He was on Those Who Can't, which was a uh, one of the first scripted dealies for True TV. And aside from that, uh, I don't know. Yeah, that Rory Scovel, like I said. I'm all like, that Rory Scovel? I have no idea who he is. A woman sues a car dealer for $1,410 for cars she claims he never delivered. The defendant claims he did find the cars, but none of them suited her. And Doug said, again, the plaintiff gets half the money, $705. Why do I think this is going to be a running gag? I've never seen Judge Judy say, I'm going to give you half the money because I can't really determine it. I mean, Judge Judy's like, okay, you're getting all of it or you're getting none of it. None of this halvesies stuff. You're a halvesies. You're a halvesies. Well, hey, if you're halvesies and I'm halvesies, we're a holesy. Yay. Okay. Episode 8, Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow. And the guest bailiff was Brandon Wardell. Yes, that Brandon Wardell. You heard what I said. That Brandon Wardell? Do I need to repeat myself? That Brandon Wardell. Uh, dude, he's, I, I know who he is. He's from High Point. He sings with the, he sings with the Jersey Boys. Again, I'll take your word for it. A woman sues her friend for $2,500 after ordering hair extensions that never arrived. The defendant claimed they were delivered, but eaten by the plaintiff's dog. (laughs) That all comes back to dogs, doesn't it? Let's move on, but first, Doug said the defendant's got to pay the full $2,500. Of course, the dog ate it. Boy, that's sort of like if a dog eats a rope and you got to pull it out. Never mind. Uh, 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 next episode. <laughs> N- episode nine, taken for a ride, and Tiffany Haddish is back as the bailiff. 
Woo-hoo! Yay. Yay. A woman sues her mother for $5,000 in back rent. The defendant claims she shouldn't have to repay her daughter. Doug rules in favor of the defendant. Who sues their mother? Please. I know, child, right? Child, please. Yeah, I went there. Child, please. <laughs> Thank you, Ocho Cinco. Oh, yeah, the, the T.O. And, uh, and Ocho show. Future oh, yeah, that, I still have episodes from the T.O. show, show that I recorded on DVD that I got a rip to show, put, show you guys oh, the uh, first chance I get. I, I apologize. I'm sorry for mentioning that. <laughs> episode no, you're eight. not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Episode 10, bringing sexy back to the blues. Todd Glass is your bailiff in this episode. Any relation to George Glass? I have no idea. And Todd Glass, his name rings a bell. I just don't know what he's been on. I, I'm looking at a picture well, of him. Well, he's performed on he's performed on Kimmel, Conan, Top Crab with Colin Quinn, future installment, Louie, Tosh.0, Mr. Show with Bob and David, and he has his own special on Comedy Central, so. Okay, so he's more of a stand-up comic than a TV actor, okay. Yeah. But, but yeah, I saw the picture of him, and he's like, okay, that guy, I can't put him on a certain show or what he's done, but I know who that guy is. Absolutely. A blues musician sues his goddaughter for the $500 he didn't receive for a nightclub appearance. The defendant claims she shouldn't have to pay because nobody attended the show. <laughs> oh, jeez. How bad is that when nobody attends your show? Wow. Yeah. Uh, Doug rules in favor of the defendant. No show, no dough. Yeah. Episode 11, doggone it. Oh, and we've got two bailiffs this episode. Yes. Kenny Lucas, Lucas brothers. and Keith Lucas. The Lucas Brothers, yeah. Yeah. The Lucas Brothers. Of course, of future entry, Lucas Brothers Moving Co. Hi! Yes! yes. A woman sues for $5,000 after her pet sitter refused to return her chihuahua. The defendant claims the chihuahua was abandoned and now belongs to him. Doug ordered the defendant to return the dog to the plaintiff and ordered the plaintiff to pay the defendant $500. What? Yeah, I saw the uh, deliberations online. Because Comedy Central put all of the deliberations on YouTube. And he's like, and they're like, you know what? We should make the dog decide. And since the defendant didn't get the dog, he got $500 instead? That's interesting. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking if this is like every other court show ever, I'm thinking, hey, it's not my money. Hey, hey, this is Comedy Central's money. Yeah, and also, let's remember, the judge is high during this and both bailiffs are high. <laughs> Two bailiffs. Is there Both anybody? High. Is there anybody on this show who's not high? No. Well, maybe the uh, maybe the plaintiff and the defendant. Maybe the plaintiff and the defendant. Yeah. And uh, even that may be a little iffy. Episode twelve: The Great Screw Dini and Michael Ian Black is back. A magician sues another magician for five thousand dollars, claiming he stole one of his tricks. Oh, this sounds like the thousand dollar joke episode. The defendant claims that the trick is an old trick and he shouldn't have to pay. And Doug awards the plaintiff, oh, another wacky amount, not $35, $1,050. Because $1,000 was too low and $1,100 was just too high. Ten fifty. That's just right. I said $1,100 was too high. <laughs> Nothing was too high <laughs> in this episode. Yeah, nothing was too high on this show. Episode 13, radio hits, and your bailiff is Joey Diaz. Yes, you heard me, that Joey Diaz. The Joey Diaz from the Joey Diaz? This, seriously, I don't know who he is. No, oh, Joey Diaz oh. was on My Name is Earl, and he's a regular on the Joe Rogan experience, so. No, again, he's another one of those people. The name doesn't ring a bell when you, but when you see a picture, 
I remember he, him on on My Name Is Earl. So yes, and he I, was I, a referee in basketball. Okay, well that's a little more popular than My Name Is Earl, I think. So he's a known entity, as we would say. A woman sues her ex girlfriend for eight hundred dollars for breaking her car radio. The defendant claims she doesn't know anything because she was provoked. And Doug says the plaintiff wins and doesn't get eight hundred dollars. She gets eight hundred and seven dollars and ninety seven cents. Where uh, does that seven dollars and ninety seven cents come from? Comedy Central's pockets. That's where it comes from. Oh no, I meant is that like somebody's extra value meal got damaged in the? Uh... <laughs> well, uh, there's got to be a reason. There, there's another seven dollars and ninety seven cents there. Think about I, it. And why I you... am. It's crazy. And while you do, let's go to episode 14. Two's companies, three's a crowd. And hey, guess who's back? Tiffany Haddish. Yep. Uh, She's a fan of the show. Yeah, this is another episode where you got to go to YouTube for all the highlights. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, Chico will be here all week. A man sues for $1,250 for a security deposit for the apartment she rented. The defendant claims she shouldn't have to pay because the plaintiff skipped out on the lease. Doug says the defendant has to pay the $1,250. Well, those leases are tough. Yep. Yeah, you uh-huh. skip out on it, you gotta pay. <laughs> Episode 15, Model Misbehavior with Rory Scovel. Again, a woman sues her son for the $300 she wasn't repaid for cosmetics. The defendant claims he doesn't have to pay because the products caused him to break out Costing him a modeling gig. Doug orders the defendant to pay the $300. Okay. Episode 16. Hey, Joey Diaz is back again. Yeah, that guy from My Name is Earl. Dude, where's my truck? A man sues his friend for $1,800, claiming that he lost his truck. The defendant claims the truck was stolen by the plaintiff's other friends. And Doug orders the defendant to pay just $250. Yeah, this is another one of those where you have to go to YouTube to get to sort of the uh, sort of the meat and potato chips and French fries of the situation. Ooh, sounds like munchies if they're getting high. See, see, bless you, Mike. You get this. It, 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 it all comes full circle. I get it. Episode seventeen: Good faith, hope, and charity. And Beth Stelling is your bailiff. Uh, God, that name sounds familiar. I just don't remember from where. Because that name rings a bell, too. And doesn't have a Wikipedia. Oh, well, she does have a Wikipedia page. It's not linked. Stelling. Okay, she, she's a stand-up comedian. Okay, she was uh, on the Netflix series The Stand-Ups, and she wrote Crashing on HBO. Yeah. Again, and, uh, and The Last OG on TBS. Yeah, again, another name that rings a bell, but yeah, we we don't immediately recognize what she's done. A woman sues a car dealer for the $2,000 deposit she lost on a truck she never received. The defendant claims he owes her nothing because his deposits are non-refundable. And Doug said, guess what? This deposit is refundable. $2,000 to the plaintiff. There you go. Oh, no. I'm just looking at this next episode, episode 18. Just the name of the episode... Already brings like shivers in my spine. Oh no, what is Here we it? go, here we go, here we go. Joint apartment. Oh <laughs> Todd Glass is your bailiff again for this episode. A man sues his ex roommate for five thousand dollars in back rent. The defendant claims he doesn't owe any money because the apartment was unlivable. And Doug says, you know what? It was livable. Five thousand to the plaintiff. Oh, gosh. I'm I'm sorry. These last three episodes, Joint Apartment and these last two, they really are doing like the drug slang play on words here. Episode 19, Smoked Out Couch. This is another uh, episode that I saw the deliberations on YouTube. And yeah. (laughs) And this is is one of those things where it's like, okay. (laughs) <laughs> the Lucas Brothers are back as as played. Well, I'm going to let you talk about it, but the Lucas Brothers are back as uh, bailiffs. Yes, they are. Good. 
a man sues for $1,600, claiming the defendant burned his couch with a joint. The defendant denies the accusation, and again, Doug gives the plaintiff half of what he wants, $800. Yeah, the interesting thing about this one, when they were talking about, they were talking about this in deliberations, you know. Delibery, <laughs> deliberations, and it seems like they were sort of, kind of thinking. You know what? These two have talked a lot to each other. Thinking, you know, something might be up, and it goes back to depreciation and uh, leather couches versus not leather couches. You know, for a uh, for for people who are totally b- smam bam boom boomed. They got really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Really, uh, deep. Thank you. I was, I was trying to look for a $10 word and all I had was 50 cents. I thought you were going for a drug reference there. Hey, why not? This, uh, this entire series is just a series well, of yeah, drug let's, references. Yeah, they, let's just say they knew how to hash things out. There's your oh, drug reference. Oh, God, Chico, why? You, you know, I, now I know why Chico sticks around on this podcast. <laughs> it, it's such a cushy position. Oh. <laughs> Not you too, Mike. It's 420, what can I say? Final episode, oh, hallelujah. Driving Bud's bad behavior. Slate Johnson's back. Black Jesus is back as the bailiff. Oh, nice. A man sues his friend for $900 after lending him the money without being repaid. The defendant claims he shouldn't have to pay because he was drunk at the time. That's no excuse. (laughs) Don't care if you're drunk. It's legally binding. Plaintiff gets the whole $900. (laughs) I mean, this has been covered on Judge Judy and, and other TV shows. Judge Mathis, I'm sure, has done this. And Extreme maybe Judge Hakeem. Extreme I'm Hakeem. Sorry. Oh, Extreme Hakeem. And actually, Extreme Hakeem probably had uh, the, the defendant pay him back while being drunk. He'd force him to drink even more. Oh, dear. Extreme Hakeem, indeed. Eye for an eye, baby. Well, as Chico mentioned, there's tidbits of this online. There's, again, for lack of a better word, highlights. <laughs> highlights. Well, well, they are really highlights. And when we first submitted this show, full episodes were actually online. They were online through Comedy Central's Australian website. But since this was submitted and now that we're recording, the episodes have been taken offline, which oh. is a shame. Yeah. yeah. You want to watch the actual show, you have to go to Google Play, Amazon, iTunes, or I don't even think it's on Amazon. No, it's not on Amazon. I checked it's, Amazon. It's not, on it's not Amazon. there anymore. It's yeah. on Google Play yeah, and there. iTunes. And even Google Play is limited to just two episodes. Yep. You want the you want the whole season or you have to go to uh iTunes. You can uh, 19 bucks. It's yours. Yeah, but like I told Greg before we started the show, I paid $10 on Google Play for the entire series of The Cool Kids. I'm not paying $20 for 20 11-minute episodes. I'm sorry. Why not? Yeah, why not, Mike? Well, you know, stimulus money. Let's do it! (laughs) Yeah. Well, Chico... Unless you have any closing arguments, I think we're going to put this one to rest. Well, Mike, what can I say except the high court with Doug Benson? It was, like all other court shows before it, a court show with a hook. And that hook, of course, being Doug Benson totally on that Illmatic. And it wasn't that ill. It was just a thing on TV. Yes, it was. Remember, it was a very sticky, icky thing on TV. And it's one that really is forgotten because it didn't last long and it didn't rerun. Yeah, Comedy Central never reran these. After that 20th episode, 
boom, gone. Again, for lack of a better phrase, using a drug pun, it went up in smoke. <laughs> Very good, Mike. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Place Your Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have over two dozen podcasts available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaceFeedNation.com. We now offer them to you on two great feeds. On the PlaceFeedNation Wrestling feed, we dive into topics running the gamut from today's WWE to the glory days of yesteryear and the ins and outs of the territory days. In addition to our full-length shows, we also deliver to you special pod blasts on topics old and new. The Place to Be Nation pop feed is a veritable treasure trove of great content. Offer tremendous shows covering the land of movies, television, life, comics, and sports. Brought to you by the most knowledgeable and insightful folks in the podcast world. You can find all these great shows, plus archives of our past podcasts from over the past eight years as well, by subscribing to both feeds on iTunes. And while you're there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows, plus others, available on PlaceMedation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth search projects, and much more. Be sure to support our site by using www.PlaceMedation.com forward slash Amazon when doing your online shopping. We want to thank our friends at Bonehead, the Wing Bar, ProWrestlingOnly.com, and the History of Wrestling.com as well. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. PlaceMedation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Episode 52, Submission 154, Infiltrator. Infiltrator aired as part of Season 1 of CBS Summer Playhouse on August 14th, 1987. For one glorious episode. One glorious episode! I think we're being generous by saying one glorious episode. Yeah, especially since one of us didn't make it past about 12 minutes. No, one of us did not. So a bit of explanation of what was going on here. There was a time where people did not air talent shows, game show reboots, or reruns of stuff that aired in Australia over the summer. Yeah, I said it. Yeah, they needed some programming to fill these networks. They didn't know they didn't know what to do. We can't show the same reruns of the same crap we've been airing all year long. We gotta come up with something different for these people. Uh, come up with some new crap. So they did. They decided to uh networks have decided to basically turn every pilot that did not make it to series into a bit of an anthology series. Which makes me ask, why didn't NBC air Malcolm in 1983? (gasps) Because nobody at NBC was high. Come on, now. Oh, oh, that was the last episode where everybody was high. Yeah. (laughs) Wait, Doug Benson was in Grant Tinker's office back in 1983. (laughs) Anywho... Enter the CBS Playhouse, and of all the pilots that aired on season one of CBS Summer Playhouse, this was one of them. Uh, This was a show called Itchful Trader, which was basically what would happen if Scott Bakula teleported inside his colleague's office and became one with an intergalactic space probe. I wish I was kidding. Yeah. So, so it's sort of a mix of Auto Man and Cartman gets an anal probe? Yes. Yep. Yeah, basically. Remember Turbo Teen? By the way, that's a future entry. It's sort of like that. Only with uh, what looks like the eye from 2001 A Space Odyssey. You know, it's funny, considering Scott Bakula is in this. I know this is pre-Quantum Leap, but you know what this reminds me of? What does it remind you of? Do you remember those series of VHS tapes involving uh, Colin Baker called The Stranger, where it was kind of like Doctor Who? where it had, like, actors related to the show, but they couldn't legally call it Doctor Who. This is what this feels like. You have, like, a 
you have like a doctor, in this case, Scott Bakula's character, with a project that is underfunded. And so he decides to experiment on the project and everything goes wrong. Yeah, he's, it, it, it wouldn't be unlike him stepping into the Quantum Leap Accelerator and mysteriously banishing. It really wouldn't. It would, except in this case, he sort of reappears in his colleague's office. His colleague, by the way, is played by Deborah Maloney. Yeah, I don't know who she is either. Or, or, or Deborah Ferentino is what she's credited under in IMDb. Ah, now I know who she is. There you go. Yeah, you, just the difference between a married name and a and a maid name. It appears. Mm-hmm. So the our our adventure begins with our intrepid doctor teleporting a pencil. It's a little bit on fire, but he gets the thing to work. Oh, and one thing I should mention, Scott Beckel's character in this pilot is is very much into old television shows. Yeah. First time we see him, he runs out of his office screaming, yabba dabba do." I got a question. Do you think he was a fan of future installment, the Flintstone Kids? Probably. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, no. He went there. Yeah, he did. So now he's going to go back into the lab after having run there across campus, it looks like. Now he's going to teleport there where he's going to run into an intergalactic space probe codename Project Interceptor. And I'm looking at the probe now. It's huge. How huge is it? It's so huge that Blank used it for a toothpick. That was terrible. Anyway. <laughs> I've got my answer, Gene. <laughs> I've got future installment. The Big Show Show. <laughs> Don't know if that's going to be a future installment, but maybe it's on the list eventually. Maybe. <laughs> or, or we can actually mention George Mirasan, who was in the movie and future installment on the <laughs> spinoff podcast. It was a thing at the movies. My Giant with Billy yes! Crystal. <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> My Giant. Oh, geez. There we go. We're going back to spinoff podcasts. It was a thing at the movies. It was a thing at the fast food drive through Now we're back in form. <laughs> okay, so back to Scott Bakula being teleported into his colleague's lab. Uh, oh, yeah, before we mention that, before he teleports into his colleague's lab, what does he say? He says, beam me up, Scotty. Which if Scott Bakula's character knew anything about... <laughs> Star Trek, he'd know that he that Captain Kirk never said beat me up, Scotty. The closest he ever said to that, it was in Star Trek 4 when he says, Scotty, beam us up. So, Hasht- so, hashtag the Mandela effect. Some television some television ban, am I right? Yeah. So yeah, he so he appears in Carrie Langdon's lab again, smoking. Not unlike the pencil. But something disappears. The probe. What? So the probe is missing, but what you don't know, and what Carrie doesn't know, is that... uh Uh-oh. He's sort of chemically bonded with the probe. Again, not unlike future installment, Turbo Team. the hell is Turbo Teen? Turbo Teen. Guy in a Camaro drives himself into a secret government lab. Okay. It was awesome! I want to say it was a cartoon from what? Maybe about 30 years ago? Yes. 
okay. Yeah, actually, even longer than that, uh, it says uh, 1984, so 35, 36 years ago. Yeah. I know what Chico's talking about, though, so I can definitely vouch for him. Yeah, so while everybody's looking for the probe, nobody seems to notice it's in Scott Bakula. Yeah. Nobody noticed this. No. No one figured this out. And also there's this there's this scene where Scott Bakula is being chased by what was it? Somebody somebody wanted to get the probe or something? Uh-huh. Uh, because there always is. There's always yes. some sort of industrialist on a boat in a suit looking for the probe to use to his own nefarious ends. Yep. So Scott Bakel, he's walking, he's singing the Jetsons theme while this guy's chasing him. And all of a sudden, like, Scott Bakel can, like, see in, like, red, like, night vision. And so during this chase, like, all you can hear is crickets. You can tell that they, they did not even bother to score this unsold pilot. Because all you can hear is crickets during this chase scene. Yep. That's awfully lazy. You can get some money to afford a composer. They spent all the money on the, on, well, Interceptor. And by Interceptor, I mean the suit. We'll get, we'll get to that, though. Yeah, so what we presume is the guy who's chasing Scott Bankula gets knocked out by Scott Bankula. Carrie Langdon goes after Scott Bankula, and she says, where is the probe? And then Scott Bankula takes his hand, which has now become like a robot arm. It's like a power glove on steroids, basically. Yeah, it is a power glove on steroids. It's a jacked up power glove on steroids is what Scott Bakula has on. Yep. And what happens is the interceptor probe has three levels of defense. It is the whole thing is based upon self preservation. Level one sort of uh defends the host passively. Level two defends the host actively. Level three, that's when things get real. And then there's hijinks on, like, the highway where they're driving. It's like, uh, Carrie's driving like a madman. In comes level one, basically protecting the host. Then she continues to drive like a madman, and then somebody else drives like a madman. In comes level two, and Interceptor basically blows the truck up. Now, we don't go to level three just yet. No, they got to save that shit for the end. Yep. So now we get to beat the guy who funded the project for the probe on his yacht. John J. Stewart. So the head of the Stewart Institute of Technology, where they both work. Yeah. Wait. Played by Charles Keating, another one of those folks who, if you don't know the name, when you see his picture, you'll be like, ah, I know who that is. Uh huh. I just find it funny he was playing a character named John Stewart. John J. Stewart. Yeah. Would he go on to host the Daily Show? Uh, no, you're thinking of John Stewart Leibowitz. Nice guy, that guy. Oh, I saw it. See what you did there. Yep. Carry on. So, John J. Stewart makes an offer to Mr. Mister Interceptor. An offer he really can't afford to refuse. Work for me. Work for, it's like, work for me with all these uh, secret sort of missions while we try and separate you from the Interceptor. 
I mean, the infiltrator. I've been saying, <laughs> in, how many how many times have I said interceptor on this you, thing? You've and said it a few say, times. Yeah, you've said it a few times. I'm like, wait a minute. I <laughs> meant infiltrator. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, they always refer to the probe as infiltrator. I'm like, why are they always, why are they saying infiltrator? Why can't they call it the infiltrator? Nobody refers to it as the. They always nope. refer to it as infiltrator for some reason. I mean, I know the title card on the pilot said infiltrator, but at the end of the episode, which I'm, which we'll probably get to later, they call it the infiltrator. So I'm like, what? What is it? Is it Infiltrator or The Infiltrator? Nobody knows and nobody cares to know. Yeah. What happens now? The uh... Uh, What happens now is uh, somebody blows the yacht up and... Oh, yeah. And they... Infiltrator goes into full Infiltrator mode, protecting both Scott Bakula and uh, his lady friend. But our mad scientist and our rich industrialist managed to get the jump on him by capturing her. They went on to the beach after the boat got blown up. Uh huh. Then they go climbing some rocks. The villain's watching them. And... And the villain's on the phone with somebody. They're still climbing. Infiltrator finds something. Infiltrator finds the secret back door. How are you going to open up the secret back door? I don't know. How do you open a secret back door? He's going to use a rock to break okay. open the lock. Use the rock, break open the lock. Bada bing, bada boom. It's still, yeah, it's still locked. And, uh, yeah, he has no idea how to fix this without, you know, turning on his arm. Except he does, because he's using, like, a pocket. What is that, a compass? I guess so. It's it's one of the, it's, it's, as you can tell, this is one of those shows that sort of blends MacGyver with a Japanese superhero show. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, like I said, it's Auto Man three years later. Except he, except he doesn't go to zippers. <laughs> oh, that would have been in episode five of this one to series. <laughs> okay, so they so they find a hole. They're find they're in they're in the sort of evil bunker, and Scott Bakula falls off. Next thing you know, Infiltrator transforms his arm into a grappling hook. Woo-hoo! There's just one problem. Oh no, what? Where's Carrie? Oh, there's Carrie. She's been kidnapped by the mad scientist. By the way, mad scientist played by Michael Bell. So he manages to rescue our fair damsel in distress and meet Mr. Mad Scientist at the same time. Scott Bakula wants them freed right now. Michael Bell says, no way, dude. Covers the entire lab in poison gas. Now we see what happens with level three. Yeah! Enter full robot suit. And because uh, Scott Bakula was basically knocked out, Infiltrator is operating on its own. Again, this is where the show goes full Japanese superhero. Right down to the hole, he didn't really kill the doctor, which he probably should have, but whatever. Well, you can't really kill him because then he goes on to be the voice of Chaz Finster. And then we never then we never get the episode. Hold up a second. (laughs) Get it on your system now, buddy. Well, hold up, I gotta type it because this is Part of the same episode of Reds with two segments. Hold on a second. Yeah. Okay, while oh. Greg's while Greg's doing that, talking about Michael Bell, uh huh, going through his CV on uh, on IMDb, uh, I do think we need to mention 
not just his connection to Rugrats, but also uh, he, apparently he oh he, oh this show oh shit yeah hold we need up to this. oh here it goes I just finished it all right Mike I want you to read this okay I'm 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 there <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Uh, okay, I've I've never really watched Rugrats, but you've the... never watched Rugrats. I, I, I'll admit I've never seen Rugrats. <laughs> read it. I, I read it. No, out loud. I want you to read it out loud. The Rugrats were Dee went on a game show hosted by Alex Trebek, and Chucky's dad got a giant check from Pat Sajak. Yes. <sighs> okay, so as I was saying about Michael Bell. <laughs> okay, this needs to be mentioned. Plus, I'm sorry, there's more entries here. Just follow me. Okay, first, he was a voice on, and this should be a future installment if, uh, since it isn't already, the Plastic Man Comedy Adventure Show. <laughs> oh, God damn it, I forgot Plastic Man had his own animated cartoon. Yes, and also... Uh, he was a voice on The Dukes, an animated version of The Dukes of Hazard, Which I believe is already on the list, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Oh, hold up, hold up. If we already have, the, if we got The Dukes, hold up a second. Okay, but also, he was a voice on, and I know this is not a submission. Good one. Coy and Vance Duke, yes. And this I know is not a submission, but damn it, I'm going to make it a submission. The Completely Mental Misadventures of Ed Grimley. Nice. Yes. Oh. But also, hey, he was also a, a, a voice on The Flintstone Kids. Yes. And Chico, I hope you're sitting down. He was also a voice on Quickie Koala. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, I, Tex Avery. I, and I said that. And I say that while I have the Tex Avery Screwball Classics Blu-ray Blu from Warner Archive right now playing on the I, Xbox I, One. I, 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 I think we hit the, the holy uh, trinity. Well, not even trinity. It's like a, a five-pointed trinity. Plastic Man, the Quickie Koala Show, the Dukes, the Flintstone Kids, and the Ed Grimley Animated Series. And apparently the, the Ed Grimley Animated Series... Looks like it was on DVD because it says the Hanna Barbera Classic Collection. So that oh, might yeah. be one of those eleven dollar DVDs eventually. Okay. So and 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 so that was Infiltrator. No, no, no. Oh, we wait. haven't talked about the end yet. Oh yeah, that's right. Sorry. Because after talk. after the villain's been destroyed, after his layers destroyed, they're on the the rich guy, John Stewart's on the beach. With Scott Bakula and the girl. Okay, let's talk about the end then. So now that Michael Bell has been thoroughly uh, infiltrated, I guess. Yes. We're on the beach with uh, Carrie, Dr. Carrie Langdon and our uh, and John J. Stewart. Where John J. Stewart again makes the offer. Hey, work work for me. I'll try and get you free of Infiltrator. Yeah, so I guess this would have been like the series, like Scott Bakula going around the world helping Jon Stewart with his problems and stuff. It, it, it would definitely read that way, yeah. Yep. So now we've reached the end of the show with um, it's Tim Reed and I forget who Tim Reed are. and Daphne Maxwell Reed. Yeah, from, his, his wife. His wife. Okay, from F Frank's place. Okay. Well, yeah. no, his wife in real life, I believe. They're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're married in real life, and they're married on Frank's place, which was premiering that fall. And what had happened was, what had happened was, they had two nine hundred numbers to call in. To give your thoughts on this pilot. Like, if you liked it, you call this number. If not, you call that number. But anybody who knows anything about how TV works knows that this means absolutely caca poo poo pee pee nothing. No. No, it was dead in the water to begin with. Yeah. Oh, and we should mention Frank's Place future installment. Yes. yes. 
You know, guys, instead of having Tim and Daphne redo the promo for the like and didn't like for the infiltrator, you know who they should have gotten to do the 900 promo read for the infiltrator? Bernie Anderson? No, he's on another network. Okay. They should have gotten Mean Gene Okerlund to do it. <laughs> oh, jeez. Fans, it's 50 cents a call. <laughs> Fans, 50 cents a call. Call 1-900-220-2311 if you like the infiltrator, or 1-900-220-2322 if you didn't like it. Fans, don't wait another minute. Make that telephone call right now. Sorry, Mean Gene Okerlund was getting busy for his role on Tag Team four years later. Nice. Call back to last week. I guess that's it for the infiltrate. The infiltrator? Infiltrator? The infiltrate? That's another thing. Mr. Infiltrator. Mr. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Infiltrator. They didn't know how to address this before and after, but they addressed it as infiltrator on the show. But it's the infiltrator when Tim and Daphne Reed are describing it. Like, that's you- what I said. What does this. What- what is the title? Shows you exactly what this means to the network. Absolutely freaking nothing. No. But thankfully, Scott Bakula would hit the jackpot two years later with Quantum Leap. With a similar concept to this show. Yeah. And again, this is one of the this just because the pilot didn't make it to series doesn't mean that the concept is not sound. See Chuck, Jake 2.0. Uh, that sh- that show where uh, is there another show where nanobots infiltrate a, a an unsuspecting person's body? Wasn't Kyle X Y sort of like that? No, Kyle X Y was a genetically uh, altered. Okay. Uh, no, Kyle X Y was like clones and stuff. Oh, okay. But yeah, the concept alone was sound. The pilot just sucked. Yeah. And that's why the infiltrator was a thing on TV. All right, guys. It's time to play another edition of one of our new segments, eBay Price is Right. Are you ready, you found, guys? Uh, you found something related to Infiltrator on well, eBay. So, well, something related to Scott Bakula on eBay. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, boy. Here we go. Okay. So I got an original Wanam Leap TV series paperback book starter set of seven books. Now, there's a starting bid. It, the auction ends in 12 hours. But basically, nobody's going to bid on this. So I want you to know. What is the starting bid for this item of seven Quantum Leap books? $20. Mike? Oh, it's got to be more outrageous than that. I'm going to go $34.99. Uh, you have both overbid. Okay. <laughs> we both lose. Yeah. Okay. okay let me try uh, $7.99. Mike? No, I'm not going to be that person. Uh, I'll go $9.99. Starting bid, $14.95. Really? Yep, for seven Quantum Leap bucks. That's a steal, if you ask me. Just about, yeah. That's going to go in our It Was a Thing on TV library, which is adjacent to the museum. Yeah, and the funny part is, guys, one of the books is titled Too Close for Comfort, so do you think Dr. Sam Beckett met Monroe? Probably. Monroe. <laughs> I don't know if these books were before or after Scott Bakel was researching a role in Philadelphia where he ran into one of our very good friends, Ango Gablogian. I just wonder if in that book, Too Close for Comfort, if somehow Scott Bakula runs into Cosmic Cow. Oh, that'd be great. Yep. 
Ango Gablogian and Cosmic Cow. Who would have thought those two would be mentioned in an episode of this show? Yeah. Who would have thought good? Well, I guess that puts the wraps on this episode, unless you guys want to make more Cosmic Cow jokes. No. No, I think we're good. We've mentioned all everything we have to do about the Flintstone kids this episode. And, and we got in the, the mandatory Quickie Koala reference for Chico. Yep. Thank you. Well, I can say this, everybody. Infiltrator, it was no Quantum Leap. You know what's no Quantum Leap? All the stuff we got here at Place to Be Nation pop right now. We got a bunch of tremendous shows for you right now, including recently part one of the James Bond Legacy, and part one of a special five-part Pop Goes the Classic series. Scott Chris Gold begins discussing the legacy that is the James Bond franchise, along with a guest making his Place to Be Nation debut. They discuss the beginnings of the franchise from Ian Fleming and the books to the creation of a movie franchise, and the first, and some say, best actor to play the role. So sit back, have a martini, enjoy the first chapter of a journey with MI6's top agent, Bond. James Bond. In a special isolation edition of Laugh-In Theater, Andy Atherton is joined by Sean King and Logan Crossland to do a live watch of the 2005 comedy Just Friends. The guys discuss friend zones, high school pricks, rough breakups, crazy pop singers, the crime of putting fish in the microwave, bad timing for relationships, the subway diet, awkward hugs, atomic wedges, hot dental hygienists, cat fights, blowing your shot, and Jersey players. So remember, forgiveness is more than saying sorry. And in regular Laugh-In Theater, in episode 22, J. Arsenio D'Amato is joined by Andy to do a live watch of the 1978 comedy National Lampoon's Animal House. The guys discuss peeing outside, playing music on your throat, college pranks, cool professors, twisted sister getting high for the first time, nasty bowling shoes, fruit fights, shout, unhooking bras, Point of parliamentary procedure, road trips, low GPAs, losing your marbles, flat bacon, and John Belushi's eyebrows. Also, be sure to check out the PTPN Wrestling feed, which includes a dive into topics running the gamut from the days WWE through yesteryear. The feed includes Place to Be Podcast, Main Event, Ginny and the Gems, Body Pressure Luck, PTP NXT, and the NWA Saturday Special. Subscribe today. And while you're at it, subscribe to Jennifer Smith's The Jenny Position feed as well. It is the new home of Geek and Sassy Talk and Pop, Freak Out Drive-In, Telling Stories, and more. Also, check out the new North-South Connection brought to you by JT Rosero and Chad Campbell. It's the new home for Wrestling Warzone, No Holds Barred, The Extreme Theory of Dance, Jeff Learns Wrestling, and more. And on the social media pages, the greatest junk food tournament will be starting soon. Keep tabs on the tournament Facebook page for details. And we have kicked off our 2020 stretch project to determine the greatest WCW match ever. You have all year to do research, promote matches, and build your list. Conversations rules can be found at www.facebook.com slash GWCW matches or on the pro wrestling only message board. And be sure not to forget to check out PlaceBeNation.com each and every day. We have new voices and fresh takes for you articles on topics in the worlds of wrestling, sports, and pop culture, including Trent Smackdown on Fox Report, This Week at the WWE by John Crow, Paulie's Perspective, Jason CVD Deep Dive, and Ben's Unpopular Opinion. And don't forget about veteran columns like Glenn Butler's Wednesday Walk Around the Web. And if you're doing online shopping over at Amazon.com, be sure to click on the Amazon banner on the right side of the Place to Be Nation homepage or use www.placetobenation.com slash Amazon. And it takes you right to Amazon and helps out PTBN at no cost to you. Okay, so we're on our final topic of the day. And we go back to the year 1990 as NBC presented to us a pilot regarding a kid named Rodney Barnes who has one hero and his hero is a man who is coincidentally named Rodney and is the legend himself Rodney Dangerfield yes folks we're gonna go back and discuss the unsold NBC pilot from 1990 where's Rodney here we go folks enjoy come home to the best television network for news Sports and entertainment. Episode 53. Submission 209. 
Where's Rodney? That'll make sense in a few seconds. Uh, Where's Rodney aired on NBC as a one-off June 11th, 1990. Mother breastfed me through a straw. Where's Rodney? Well, my old man took me to the zoo. They thanked her for returning me. Where's Rodney? Yeah, last week I looked up my family tree. Two dogs were using it. That's the story of my life. No respect. We got to talk about the theme song. Yes, I will tell you right now, that theme song is a bop. It's a bop, but also, do you know what it reminds me of? And this is going to blow Greg's mind. And when we think about it, you're going to be like, you know what? You're sort of right. That's Where's Rodney. You know what it sounded like to me? What does Greg, it sound like? Greg, sit down, Greg. What is it? Who's Johnny? Oh, yes! Oh, my God! Yes! Yes, I knew yes! you'd agree! Yes, I knew you'd agree! As someone who loves Short Circuit, yes. I knew you'd agree with that. Uh, but I gotta say this. Where, where, who's Johnny? It's no, here's Johnny by Weird Al. <laughs> No, no, that that happens later that night. <laughs> that happens after the nine o'clock movie. Nineteen ninety. That was a heck of a time, wasn't it? Yeah. We yeah. Just... It seems like every every network every network was coming out with a lower middle class family sitcom about a teenager with a hook. Yep. Oh, oh and what a hook this one had. Yeah. Yep. 14-year-old Rodney Barnes, just trying to make it through high school. There's just one thing about him. His hero was Rodney Dangerfield. Whoa. That's amazing. So we have a guy, kid named Rodney, and his hero is a guy who's also named Rodney. I know, right? And also, if you look at this kid... He dresses like Rodney. He has the loosened tie, and then in one scene, he's wearing a back-to-school T-shirt. And his bedroom is decorated with Rodney Dangerfield movie posters and 8 by 10s of Rodney. Yeah. I mean, that's heroism you can't buy. No. I'm like, how, it's like, how do you even... Uh, 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 my mind is my, my, this has got me shook all of a sudden well, well you see I don't have Michael Jordan stuff in my bedroom at that time and I'm sure Greg didn't have well he might have had Greg the Hammer Valentine stuff at that time for all we know <laughs> no I had no I had Greg Jeffries <laughs> oh no jeez oh boy L- let's stick with the original answer Greg the Hammer Valentine <laughs> like not even Greg Jeffries has Greg Jeffries stuff dude no that's and, that is true and, and, and Chico I'm sure he didn't have Dino the dinosaur stuff in his room <laughs> <laughs> Shame. I thought, you were, I thought you were going to go for the obvious. Dean Martin. Oh, okay. I th- oh, or, I was actually also thinking Chico Marx. Or, <laughs> or, or Chico Marx or Chico DeBarge. Well, actually, Chico DeBarge would be a little bit too young. Uh, anyway. Or Chico Escuela. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just thought about another person <laughs> that would have probably have posters of. <laughs> Gregory Hines. Oh, jeez. You know what? I'll, I'd totally see that. I would totally see yes. that. Yes. Espe- especially after he <laughs> he was inquisitive about why, about Kermit and the Huggies in uh, the Muppets. Take Manhattan. Manhattan. Yep. 
By the way, Gregory Hines, subject of future entry, The Gregory Hines Show. Yes. So what about this 14-year-old kid? Well, this pilot begins, as most pilots do when you're dealing with a 14-year-old, with his pants. Or <clears throat> his feelings. Sorry. <laughs> pants feelings. With his One feelings the same. about... With his feelings about a little girl, a little girl, uh, with his feelings about a girl in his class, he really wants to ask her out. And of course, because this is uh, middle school in 1990, she's a cheerleader. It begins with a kid and a girl and him wondering, how am I supposed to talk to this girl? What would Rodney Dangerfield say? And then oh, but before that, but before that, yeah. they're in the classroom. Yes. And we got to talk about Thea Vidal. Yes. Oh, yeah. Star, yeah, star a future installment, Thea. But also, what's going on with her hair? Oh, yeah. Oh, she, she paid premium for that. She paid premium for that hair. Oh, my gosh. That was true early 90s hair going on there. <clears throat> what could I say? Tina Turner. Was still a thing on your radio in 1990, but of course, he and Vidal were also turned up in future installments. Thea Vidal as Shelton Benjamin's mama on WWE television. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah. Okay, yep. so so Thea so Thea Vidal is the teacher, and uh, also in the classroom. By the way, Rodney Bards played by. Jared Rushton, a star of... What was Jared Rushton the star of? You tell me. I don't know. Damned if I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that was a great reaction. I mean, the I name sounds out. familiar, but... I know oh, it he does. Was, oh, That's... he was in Big! He was, what, what was he? Uh, he was the kid in Big? He was, oh, Hold up a sec. Hold up. I got something even more... Oh, I just realized because because he was in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids as Ron Thompson, and there's also someone on this show who was also in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I am listening. Okay, I'll, I'll wait till we get well, till we get to it later. Because I but, also have something mind blowing about to mention. But yeah, he was in a whole lot of nothing after 1990, but I think his biggest role to date was a three-episode was a three-episode stint on Roseanne as Chip Lang. I don't know who he is either. But enough about him. Yeah. Dear Rodney, gosh, he's having girl problems, just like every teenager. And what does he do? He summons Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, what would Rodney do in this situation? And just sort of magically, whatever Rodney's doing, life stops around him. What? Well, well yeah, we see him having dinner with this very, um, how would you phrase it? Uh, airheaded floozy? Yeah, that's good. That's good right there. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so you see Rodney... Getting a steak dinner, eating at a, a steak uh, restaurant with this airheaded floozy, and suddenly he gets like this weird sensation, and you see him starting to f disappear off the screen, and he appears in the school. You know, oddly enough, there's nobody in the hallway of the school, so it isn't like Rodney's like an apparition or like uh, like Rodney the Kid's Conscience, he's there actually talking to the kid in, the, in an empty hallway, and he, he's giving the kid advice. And then as soon as he, he's done giving the kid advice, Rodney Dangerfield is gone. So we presume he just went back to the restaurant? We never see what happened to him. Uh, we're going to assume he went back to the restaurant, but also at the same time, you know, why isn't the, the uh, airheaded floozy saying, where did you go? Did you go to the bathroom or something? Yeah, we, we have no closure in that regard. And we don't even know about the steak, for heaven's sakes. Yeah, how was the steak? Well, well, he made jokes about it. You know, he, he wanted, uh, he talked about the steak being so bad there, or he didn't want the steak 
steak being so bad that he had to use a knife to cut through the gravy. Mm-hmm. And oh yeah, and, and this pilot, at least when we see Rodney Dangerfield, is just loaded with his one-liners. I mean, he went through his back Rolodex of like the last what. 20, 30 years pulling out like every joke he did because you got to remember at this time, you know, Rodney was more of a movie star because the nightclub circuit of the 60s and 70s was dead. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and also I should add in our dear uh, young Rodney's locker, he has a big cutout head of Rodney Dangerfield in there. Yeah, I'm the sorry. Uh, precursor this- to the fat head of Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, this is getting, like, borderline obsessive. Yeah, I, I don't have, like, you know, anything that I like I didn't have to that extent in my locker or around my bedroom. Uh, you know, maybe I'll have to, you know, maybe start investing in Malcolm posters or or super train stuff or, you know, for the museum, wink, wink. Uh yeah, we gotta have to get that Superman Thanksgiving Day balloon somehow. That damn balloon. Yeah, that balloon will never die. What can we say? But oh, we you know what we haven't talked about Rodney's three friends because you know if you're a kid in 1990, you gotta have friends that think you're crazy. You gotta have friends. All right, so we have uh, Breck and Meyer. Wait, wait, Chico. Did you say Breck and Meyer of future entry married to the Kellys? Yep, and also future installment inside Schwartz. Oh, yeah. And also in... Future installment, as we mentioned a couple of episodes ago, the home court. He's and a, also, he fu- wait, wait, and also future installment that we mentioned a couple episodes ago, Titan Maximum. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, and we totally forgot about another entry. <laughs> no, yeah, let's just like rack them up while we're here. <laughs> Ding, ding, he was ding, a kid ding. on Child's Play back in 1982. Yes! He was a kid on Child's Play back in 1982. And he was almost on another future installment, Coupling. Oh, but he was, he was on the old. pilot. He was also on future installment, the Jackie Thomas Show! Oh, God, we could do this all day. But we got to get to the other. We got to get to the other two. We got to get to the other two, friends. The second one is Sean DeVarich. But I like I, doing the installments. We only had seven there. Only seven. <laughs> only seven. <laughs> okay, let's see if Sean DeVarich was in any future installments. He was, oh, future installments. Throb. What? Yes, you're right. He was in Throb. <laughs> it was Throb. It was oh throb. my gosh! It's 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 an excuse to talk about Paul Walker. Is what it is. Actually, he he was the uh, person that Paul Walker originally played. If I'm not mistaken, either he originally played him or he was he was taken over by Paul Walker. One of those two. And sadly. Where's Rodney is the last entry for Sean DeVerich on IMDb. Oh, He went on a high note. Uh, yeah. Going out on a high note, indeed. And then there's his third friend, Sonia, played by some lady named Soleil Moon Fry. You mean the Soleil Moon Fry on future installment, the episode of Punky Brewster where they go to the NLC at? <laughs> yep. Only this is 1990, so uh, she's um she's starting to grow up, as it were. Yeah. Now we also have Rodney's family. There's his mom, Ann Barnes, played by Jane Daly. Do you mean the Jane Daly who appeared on an episode of Future Installment Beverly Hills Buns? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said that somebody on this show was in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids with Jared Rushton. Yes. 
No, Amy she... Zelinsky herself, Amy O'Neill, plays yep. his sister. Yes! And by the way, guys, this is not going to be the last time we talk about Amy O'Neill on this podcast, because in a couple of weeks, she's going to be a guest star in one of our installments. Episode 3 of Second Chance! Oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> Preview of coming events, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, my God. I cannot wait until we get to Second Chance. That's going to be... That's going to be at least 90 minutes, damn it. Yes, it will. That'll be me all the way. And finally, the dad, played by Jay Thomas. Oh, yes, Jay Thomas. Yeah, he of the uh, going on Letterman almost every Christmas and relaying his story about Clayton Moore. Well, among other things, but oh, my gosh, if you've never seen that, Find it. That's hilarious. Jay Thomas is like, okay, what hasn't he done? He's done. He did a lot, man. Jay Thomas did a lot. And he's trying to be the voice of reason in all of this. And it, and it is a very polar opposite of both Rodney Barnes and Rodney Dangerfield. You said what has uh, Jay Thomas done? What hasn't he done? Well, I can tell you one thing he has done. He did future installment Inc. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's just throw out every single installment these people are on. Yeah, I think we, I think we I think we pretty much have all of that covered. Yeah. Oh, I don't think we've covered what uh, installments Randy Dangerfield's gonna be on. Oh, oh no! Oh, oh no! no. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you right there. We only have so much time. <laughs> you continue on my research. Okay. So so we have this completely level-headed family with this manic son who obsesses ro- over Rodney Dangerfield and he's li- and he's like the polar opposite of his entire family. Yeah, his family is reasonably normal. Mhm. Yeah, they seem like a perfectly normal American family. It's just that it so happens their kid loves Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, it makes him a bit of a black sheep in the family. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, so we're heading to the commercial break, right? Well, I've been watching this uh, this episode for a while now, and I've seen the, a whole lot of classic 90s commercials we have what the AT and T put it in writing commercials. Dick Tracy at McDonald's. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I, I remember that contest they did back in the day. Yeah, that Dick Tracy contest is no McMillions. No, we get scammed out of not winning a million dollars. Oh yeah, that guy. Yep. By the way, McMillions, really good watch. I suggest it. Oh, yes, that in the podcast, absolutely. Mm-hmm. By the way, there's also a promo for a new summer hit that NBC has in the summer of 1990 called uh, Seinfeld? I don't think this show's going to last, guys. Uh, I don't know. It's a show about nothing, man. I mean, how many, how many episodes do you get out from a show about nothing? Yeah, but, I mean, it is co-created by this guy on... The uh, show Fridays. Uh, Larry David, I think his name is. Uh, Wait, you mean future installment Friday? (laughs) 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 We got to talk about some more commercials. Yes. Okay. Okay, because uh, there's one commercial for Planters Peanuts and doesn't have baby peanuts. It has Mr. Peanut. And it has a couple doing, and oh, if this isn't timely in 1990, nothing is, the Lombada. Oh, yeah. A no-touch Lombada using shadows. Mike, do you think Mr. Peanut told stories about him doing the Lombada to Conan when he was on his show a while back? (laughs) Inside jokes are the best jokes. Oh, oh, and that's only in the first commercial break. (laughs) We haven't even gotten to the second commercial break uh, as Rodney the Younger is 
stressing over the 14th birthday party. Oh, oh hold up. Yeah, we got a little promo slide that has the uh, the station ID for where it's airing on, Mike. It's it's from your area. It is my area, WKYC. What would WKYC's news have been at the time, Mike? Good. Good? Better. <laughs> Now, I'm not a fan of, of WKYC's news nowadays. Oh. They're a Tegna station. And this they, is Tegna. <laughs> yeah, they're a Tegna station. They've got the USA Today colors, and now their newscasts have different names. What's going on? What's new? Just give me the news. I don't care what's going on, what's new. And, yeah, they do that. Every single newscast. I, hey, I read FTV Live. I know what's up, all right? Yeah. More ways that TV's being ruined. Oh, hey, it's Lobster Fest. Lobster Fest, yeah. You can get a $1.99 kid's meal at Red Lobster right now. Well, well, 30 years ago. 30 years. Well, you can't go to Red Lobster nowadays, obviously. Oh, now hold on. You've talked about the Seinfeld ad. How did you miss the ad for Unsolved Mysteries that Wednesday? Oh, uh. Unfortunately, Mike, it's not the Unsolved Mysteries with the Magic Rock, which we'll cover in future installment, the WTF stories of Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, shit, that's like, 20, episodes. That's like 20 installments we've covered. <laughs> it's like we spent more time on this episode talking about future episodes than we did on the, on the uh, actual show. Well, it's a 21-minute pilot. What do you want it? And then the PSA for drug use or don't I remember this PSA. Yeah, this one's It's classic. Yes, drugs are for suckers. Drugs are for for suckers, man. Oh, don't you ever do drugs, man. No. Otherwise the partnership for a drug free America is gonna be on your ass. All right, now the kids are getting ready to go to their birth. Well, Rodney's birthday party. He's hoping, hoping beyond hope, that Cindy, our cheerleader, played by Dave Choden, a uh, future installment, Uncle Buck. Nailed it. <laughs> wait, 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 which Uncle Buck? The 1990 version or the Mike Epps version? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I'm gonna guess by the yes, you're meaning the Kevin Meany version. Both, yeah, I'm like no, both of them. Well, she was in the Kevin Meany version, but we're gonna be covering both of them. Yeah, good. Everybody's getting ready to go to Rodney's party. He's well, Rodney's pretty much Rodneying it up here, and his mom is giving Rodney a gift. Remember, this is a 14 year old child. He got a cowboy hat and a little cap gun. What? Yeah, but to make it even worse, uh, his family wants him to put it on, and as he has it on, guess who walks in the door? Oh, hi, Cindy. Yeah, his crush. And oh, that was no. the moment his ego got crushed. Oh. oh. Yeah, yeah, that... I don't want to be seen by my my crush in a, a, a with a cowboy hat and a cap gun on like I'm five years old. No. So what does Sonya have to uh, follow that one up? She gives him a baseball glove. I wonder if she got that at Wrigley Field at the NLCS. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Nailed it. Anyway, he's trying to get at Cindy. Meanwhile, everybody is in his way for some reason. Particularly his grandparents. Yeah, I know how it feels. Your grandparents are at your birthday party and your crush is at your birthday party, too. It's like a, it's like a potentially embarrassing situation for our friend Rodney right here. Yeah, so you know what he does? He goes back to his bedroom and he summons Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, well, where's Rodney now? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, you... one of the people he runs into, Lisa's new boyfriend, Spit, who, because it's 1990, is a punk rocker. 
is a pre-grunge punk rocker. Yeah, he's a pre-grunge punk rocker, but also he's a college student. I think uh, he's introduced or uh, he, he's mentioned to be like a med student. So he's a pre-grunge punk rock med student. There's a combination for you. Wow. So young Rodney goes to his bedroom and summons Rodney for assistance on what to do. Because Cindy is about to seal the deal here. Yeah, but now where's Rodney at this point? Rodney Dangerfield, that is? Where is Rodney? He's fencing! What? He's fencing? He's He's fencing! Rodney Dangerfield is fencing! Yeah! He's fencing. He's fencing. I, I would have never guessed that. Who would have thought that one of the one of the greatest comedians of our time was a big fan of fencing? I would have never guessed. So Rodney got summoned, and he uh, was still in his fencing garb, his fencing attire, and he tells young Rodney, why don't you go on a double date with your grandparents? Yeah, just Which isn't a it, bad idea. Yeah, it isn't a bad idea. It, it, it sort of lessens the pressure on young Rodney. And going with his grandparents on the double date, you know, they've got a little experience because they've been around the block once or twice. So Rodney the Younger actually goes with that idea. Hey, do you want to go on a double date with my grandparents? Oh, Rodney, that's a brilliant idea. That's his grandmother, not not uh, the, the, the crush. <laughs> And, and yeah, and so it works out in the end. Oh, good. Before we find out what happened on our double date, we have more commercials. Remember the time when the Looney Tunes were in were infiltrating Holiday Inn? No. Yeah, you know? not really. No, not really. I totally remember that. That was so classic. I'll and then, tell you. Th- I'll tell you this. Uh-huh. That wasn't the best thing that involved the Looney Tunes in 1990. <laughs> because the best thing that involved the Looney Tunes in 1990 was future installment. Happy birthday, Bugs, 50 Looney years. Oh, jeez. Okay, we also have a commercial for Nut and Honey Crunch. Oh, Sorry. those are popular back in the day. What you eating there? Nut, Nut honey. and Honey. Yeah. No, no, I mean, I see you eating something there. What are you eating? Nothing, Not honey. honey. <laughs> it, was okay. done, it was done better in Men on Film. It really was. There's one more ad we got to cover. Oh, we're Kmart. talking about Kodak and Kmart? <clears throat> yeah, we got to cover that. There's also an ad for Kodak 35mm cameras, twenty nine ninety six For what brand is that? That's Oh, it's a Kodak camera. At Kmart. Yeah, you just said it was a Kodak camera. At Kmart. Well, there's Kodak film. I didn't know if it's a Kodak camera. Two things that'll never go away, guys. Kodak film and Kmart. Well, one of them's on the brink. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we're back. Uh, That's the joke. Hey, Mike. That's the joke. Duly noted. Okay, so we're back in the hallway. We're getting the deets on the dates about, I feel like Andy Cohen. We're getting the deets on the date. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'll be funny in about 25 years. We're getting the deets on the dates. And it looks like Cindy and Rodney are about to be middle school official when in comes Cindy with somebody else. Oh, oh. That, that 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 seems like my middle school and high school years, like, every week. Oh, I got a crush on this girl, and then she walks by with the star football player. Not even the star football player. It's some guy with a leather jacket and slick back hair. But, well, that, well, that works for me, too. It's always some guy. And, and we have one more shot with Rodney and Rodney. And he's like, hey. Don't feel too bad. I'm happy when girls walk out on me. They're usually running. Oh, I tell you. I got no respect. No respect at all. And as... <laughs> oh, hold up. I got a joke here. Oh, no. 
Yeah, because just ask Rodney, because in 11 years, he's going to be in a shower with two girls in the middle of some insane dream sequence by one of Vince McMahon's cameramen. Oh, no. No. Greg, go to your room. (laughs) But wait, we already covered that in the XFL episode. Yeah, we did. That's the joke. Oh, geez, another one where I get that's the joke. Yeah. Well, hold up. We got to talk about the credits because they have a voiceover, and then there's a promo for like the upcoming movie of the week with Gary Cole. So the voiceover over the uh, hip instrumental of the theme music, which is still a bop. It's plugging the Hogan family and some movie sorry Gary Cole and somebody else. I, I don't Joanna know. Joanna Kearns from Growing Pains. Because it's Monday night in 1990, and the Made Fours are popping. Yes, the mo- those she left behind. Monday, no, oh, it's later tonight on NBC. What am I talking about? Yeah. Oh my God, a heart wrenching drama with Gary Cole and Joanna Kearns. Right after you've seen <laughs> this pilot of Rodney Dangerfield. Amazing. Indeed. Oh, and you know who was behind this whole thing? Aaron Spelling. Which you probably wouldn't know because it seems like everyone and their mother was (laughs) keeping their name off of this pilot. Don't understand why, but there you go. Hmm. You know, this could have had potential, but it was just taken the wrong way. Yeah. I, I don't like the whole, you know, summoning Rodney thing. And the thing is, unfortunately, the only other idea I had was already taken, and we talked about it in uh, earlier about the advertisements. I wonder if this might have been better if you went down the, the Seinfeld route. But then you'd be copying Seinfeld and, you know, oh, well, you're just a big phony. Okay, then. Well, plus also, you only get to see Rodney Dangerfield three times in the episode. You had him summoned for like a minute from the steak uh, restaurant. You had him summoned for like a minute from the fencing thing. And you have him at the end just like mysteriously come out of the back hallway uh, at the school and just say, it's okay, kid, it's happened to me. So it's like, okay, the, the, the main character in your show appears for no more than three minutes. That... I think I think you could argue that the main character was Rodney Barnes. Well, but the, the focus, the title, it says, where's Rodney? That's not saying, where's Rodney Barnes? Where's Rodney Dangerfield? So I would say the title character is Rodney Dangerfield. Well, if you're listening out there, why don't you help us settle this? I guess we'll put a poll up on our Twitter account. Who was Where's Rodney about? Rodney who's, Dangerfield. Who's the title character of Where's who's Rodney? The title of, who's the title character of Where's Rodney? Rodney Barnes or Rodney Dangerfield? And yes, I will put up that poll. It'll be up until next week, and we'll do the results next week. Oh my god, yeah. We'll be anxiously and, awaiting the results of that. Engagement! Yes! Yeah, engaging our listeners. Because, you know, we, 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 we don't do much outside of the occasional bonus little tweet or or random image on, on, on Instagram. So now you get to chime in. Yeah. www.twitter.com slash it was a thing on TV. But hey, we'll mention that later at the end of the show. Oh, wait, we're there. Hey, Chico. Where's Rodney? Had Rodney Bards? Had Rodney Dangerfield? It had a lower middle class family with a teenager growing up with his friends and his obsessive compulsiveness with Rodney Dangerfield. It had a whole lot of what would come to be known as the 90s television. But in 1990, sadly, it was a thing on TV. It was a thing on TV that preempted probably a reasonably good episode of Elf. Because Alf would have been airing its last season in summer in 1990 on Monday nights. Well, by then, it probably would have already ended because, again, 
It aired on in June 11, and the season would have ended in May. Well, reruns. Okay, there you go. Anywho, for more information about this episode and our past episodes, you can hop over to our website. It was a thing on TV.com. You'll find out more about the show, more about us, uh, all of our social feeds where we will post the poll question, who's Rodney, who's, where's Rodney about? That's going to be interesting. Yeah, we're going to get all five votes. <laughs> yes. And also, remember, every Wednesday, three of our episodes in our back catalog go up on the Place to Be Nation pop feed. Oh, and I got I got something to mention for you guys, considering that this would be in the, the, uh, the fifth, because next week, the week we're recording this, will be 48 through 50 this coming Wednesday, the week we're recording this. So next week will be 51 through 53. So I figure I might as well get this out of the way right now, since this would be the end of the third episode in like two weeks. Uh, right now on the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, one of me and one of my friends, Robert Silva, we did a top 10 of the uh, top 100 uh, matches of their greatest WWE matches on television poll. And we did a special uh, two-part podcast about it and the first part of it went up uh recently so if you want to listen to that go ahead and guys i gotta mention to you guys since i want to bring it up right now we discussed bruce hart on the podcast but sadly we did not bring up the west edmonton molar <laughs> <laughs> that's for you robert o'connor and, and, and that's gonna be on uh, a bonus outtakes episode eventually but that's enough for now. We got an episode coming up on Wednesday. Oh, this next one. If you thought Where's Rodney was bad or miscategorized or misdone, wait till Thursday. We got an episode which is, oh, this is a bad one. But we'll just keep it at that. Stick around uh, and suffer with us through that episode. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for listening and... Again, we'll be back with episode 54 this Thursday of It Was a Thing on TV. Wow! No respect to tell you. Oh, I get no respect. Where, Where is Rodney? Is Rodney?